Jose Amite is my name and I'm saved. Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm mentioning that because one time when we were in our pastoral uh, conference, presiding bishop, Reverend Diego, stood up and said, Mimi ni Silas Diego, nani mawako ka Yesu Christo ni buwana. And for the first time I said, who didn't know that? But again, it is good to mention these things. It's good to affirm that I am saved, Jesus Christ is Lord. And we thank God that he has called us into, from the world of darkness into his marvelous light. And he knows us by name. I fellowship in this church, Watunasema Tunasomea Kanisa Hili. I love God that he called me to this ministry. I love preaching, but I fear teaching the most because of James chapter 3 that says, we who teach will be judged more strictly. <laughs> and that is the fear. But again, God called me into this ministry and teaching is my line that he gave me. So it is actually a double caution. I love it, but I fear at the same time. In the church, I love two places. One is here at the sanctuary, a place where we grow, we listen to the word of God, we get our spiritual nourishment, we grow in our knowledge of him. But another part that I love is down at the basement. Because of the basement, that is where we get responses. And some of the responses are very, very personal responses. A few weeks ago, a man, a member of this church, at the basement, told me, Pastor, there is a problem. And of course, he was talking to me in a different language, not this one that I'm using. That there is a problem that in life, sometimes when men, our fathers, pass on after working very hard to acquire some wealth for their children, and after they pass on, within a very short time, the world disappears and the children who remain behind are almost going back to begging. And then he said, Nini wachungaji munafaa kufanya research na mutufundishe? And then as he was leaving, he told me, Pastor umesikia, mufanya research na mutufundishe? In the course of my studies, I was studying First Chronicles. This is the book that I've been reading through this season. And I found very, very interesting lessons that will be a great encouragement to me as it answers that question at the same time. First Chronicles chapter 22 from verse 1 onwards. Actually, I'll consider the whole chapter. I'll consider the whole of it. But at the same time, as I give just a brief, a brief overview of this chapter, my reflection this afternoon, or the lessons that I'll bring to our attention, because we study the word of God so as to draw lessons that will help us in our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. We don't just study and go. We study so that we get the lessons that can help us as we walk with him every day as we wait for his second coming. And the lesson that I'm bringing to attention this afternoon is on experiencing God, life's great lessons. Life great lessons. In life they say, experience is the best teacher. But unfortunately you can't live long enough to experience everything. Sometimes you learn from other people's experience so that you know that this is a caution to be avoided or this is a lesson that needs to be embraced. And today we'll draw some lessons from David, great lessons for us in life. In this chapter, a quick overview, David had a strong desire to build a house for the Lord. It was in his heart. Because every time he went to his palace as a king, he would sleep comfortably, he would sit comfortably, he would do everything that he needed comfortably as a king in his palace. But also at the same time as he went to worship, in the place of worship, it was actually represented by a tent. And this was a heavy burden in his heart. That how comes that the house of the Lord stands out there represented as a tent? How does it work for me as a king? 
And so he had in his heart that I need to build a house for the Lord. And it is good to have these burdens sometimes. Because the burdens that we have in our hearts can move us to action and positive action. And so as David is planning, and David would always communicate these things to God, privately, God told him, sorry, David, this time you are not going to do it. And he gives him reasons that he is, why he's not going to do it. He says, you've shed so much blood, so it is not going to be, you are not the one who is going to build the temple. And the David had mentioned in the presence of God the standards that he wanted for the temple. He says it needs to be a magnificent temple. I always go with this uh, Bible that has four versions. Not because you don't understand things so quickly, but because it is good for me also to make reference to other translations. And in this translation, in the translation that uh, Amplified Version says a house of great magnificence. A house of great magnificence. That was the standard that David wanted for the house of the Lord. And so he puts his focus into the work ahead of him. He decides that because God has said I'm not going to do it, I have to put strategies in place so that when I'm not here, the project will continue to comp accomplishment with precision that I want. And so in verse 1 to 5, after he plans, he gets people together. He marshals, uh, puts people together. He got the people to work together. Those who are going to deal with stone cutting, he assembled them and told them, your job description is to make sure that anything called stone that will go to that building is done with this precision. And those who are dealing with iron, he told them, anything called iron, it is under your care. You need to do it. And on top of that, he provided even iron, bronze, and cedar timber. Everything that needed to be in that house. David made sure that it was available. In verse 6 to 10, David takes the next step, which is a great one. He educates his son Solomon. You will notice that from the reading, it was mentioned that Solomon is young and inexperienced. David knows his son. And so he educates his son Solomon, explaining to him the plan he had put together. And he says to him, I had it in my heart. And so Solomon, uh, David knew that the plan for the building of the temple is not going to be done by him. It is going to be done by Solomon. And so he takes him step by step. He tells him, son, this is the blueprint of the temple that I want to do uh, for the Lord. A temple of great magnificence. And so he educates him regarding the plans. He says, this is the plan. And he gives reason. He says, I'm not going to do it. And why am I not going to do it? Because God said I was not going to do it. I had shed a lot of blood, and so I'm not going to do it. And secondly, remember, God has also told me that you are the one who is going to do it because you will be a man of peace. You will be peaceable. In fact, another word for Solomon could mean peace, a man who will love peace. So you are going to do it. And as David explains to the son, Solomon starts learning at a very tender age that there is a big project that after my dad is out of the picture, I'm going to undertake it. He wanted Solomon to understand that what he was planning was not, not just his own plan. It had been approved by God. From verse 11 to 13, David encourages and instructs Solomon on where the secret of his success lies. He tells him, your success will lie in your trust in God. And even as he instructs him to do that, he also prays to God and says, God grant Solomon discretion and understanding, even as he rules your people. The father taking step by step, explaining facts to the son. And David encourages Solomon to walk with the Lord. He tells Solomon, 
you son, walk with the Lord. And this is a father explaining to his son, you son, walk with the Lord. A great lesson from the dad. You know, in our tradition, we always have something that men or even women in our tradition, in our Kalenjin tradition, say. They say, Majichok ngalecha. You know, anybody who knows that language knows what that statement means. It's a simple but very, very deep. It's a simple but heavy disclaimer that what you are going, the direction you are taking, that is not for us. We are out of it. And so it gives you an opportunity to do soul searching. And so David tells Solomon that you are going to walk with the Lord. These are the standards. You will not depart from him. You will walk with him. From verse 14 to 16, David heavily invests in this project to make sure that Solomon succeeds. He puts everything because he wants to leave a legacy after he is gone. From verse 17 to 19, David makes an appeal and a general appeal to the people that please, ladies and gentlemen, in my absence, please help Solomon. In this project, please help Solomon. He makes an appeal to the people to help Solomon as he undertakes the construction project. Life's great lessons that we learn from this passage. I love drawing lessons from passages of scripture because these are the practical things that we can put into practice as we live our Christian walk with the Lord each day. A pastor was given an assignment in a local church to preach. And the first Sunday he went to preach, he preached one message. And members went home thanking the Lord for such a powerful message. And they even shook his hand and told him, Pastor, that was a great message. Then he came up the, sec the second Sunday and he preached the same message again. And uh, the members, being the good members who you are, said, let us give him the benefit of doubt. Maybe he forgot that was, that was the sermon he did last week. So it was granted to him. The third Sunday, he came back again and preached the same message. And the elders council called a meeting and they said, it seems there is a problem with our pastor. It seems he has a memory lapse. Does it mean that the Lord does not speak to him beyond that message? And so the pastor was summoned and was asked, do you know that the message you preached yesterday, uh, today, and the message you preached last week were the same? And the pastor said, yes. And he was asked, what is the problem? And the pastor said, I preach on Sunday, and between Monday and Saturday, I was actually following you up. I was going around, looking at the members, and trying to figure out, did they get the lesson? Did they learn? And the first week I said, maybe you did not learn, so I will repeat the lesson again. And the second week, the same thing. Maybe you did not learn. I will preach the, the same message again. And he told them, and for your information, I have no intention to proceed to the next message until this one is implemented. <laughs> we come to church to learn so that we take these lessons and put into practice as believers so that as we live our Christian walk with the Lord each day, we send a positive message to the world that we are changed, we are children of God, we are living for him. What lessons does David bring our, to our attention from this passage? David lived so many years before Christ in incarnation, but the lessons that he brings to our attention are still very, very valuable to 21st century Christians. Lesson number one. Lesson number one. I'll bring three lessons. Lesson number one on planning, lesson number two on parenting, and lesson number three on success. Three lessons. And these are very important to me, and I know they are very, very important to you also. Lesson number one on planning. What does David remind us from this passage? He brings to our attention that in life, planning is a prudent thing to do. In life, we have to learn to plan, from verse one to five. In this passage, 
David sets a clear path for the construction project to succeed. He sits down, he plans. In fact, as he plans, he calls the different experts in that field. Remember, he's a king. Verse 2 says, So David gave orders to assemble the aliens living in Israel, and from among them he appointed stone cutters. He tells people, Come, executive order, come. Now there is a project that you are going to undertake. And remember, this project is not going to do it. He knows that clearly. But he still plans. Though he knows he's not going to be there to see the project come to fruition. But he still sets time to plan for things. And David literally planned for everything. Every detail. Every detail. He says the stones that are going to be used are these kind of stones. And the guys who are going to be dealing with the stones are these ones. The iron that is going to be used are these ones. If they are to be imported, if they were importing at that time, he would say this is the person, this is the country that is going to supply. We are going by the standards. And he says that cedar, the tim timber that we are going to use is cedar. And he supplies everything. He sets things in motion so that even in his physical absence, things will still move in the direction he wanted. If David had not planned, his dream of building a temple would just remain as that, a dream. But he sets everything, planning every step to make sure that the construction project continues. And this is a gentle reminder to us as believers, and by extension, every living being on the importance of planning. If desired goals are to be achieved, we have to sit down and plan. Back to the question, why is there a disconnect between parental properties and the children? The question at the basement, could it be because parents do plan and do not do proper planning? for whatever they are thinking about in life. David lived many centuries before Christ, but he still knew the importance of planning for any activity to succeed. And he reminds us gently, as believers, that in life, planning is a prudent thing to do. In the New Testament, Jesus talks on the same thing. He says in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, that if you want to do a project, first, you sit down and plan. The success of any project lies on strategy and planning. And as Christians in the 21st century, do we have a plan to guide our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, our plans in our daily living? Do we have plans in life? Or we are handling things as they come. You hear of people saying, on this one, I'll be dealing with the things as they come. Do we deal with things as they come or do we sit and plan? A great lesson in life, in planning and in life, planning is a prudent thing to do. Areas of planning, as a young person, planning to start a uh, family, to settle down from a uh, family, do you sit down and plan? And say, this is the kind of family that I want for myself. This is the kind of a lady that I want to marry, or this is the kind of a gentleman I want to marry. These are the number of children that I would want in life, or you would say that uh, as long as the Lord blesses us, we will give birth, and you populate your own household in the name of Christ. Do we sit down and plan? Or do we deal with things as they are? When I was still a single man, before I got married, a friend of mine told me, as you are thinking of marriage, start planning. What is that lady going to eat? And then he told me, come on, Akula, nebia grass, start planting nebia grass. <laughs> that lady is in the congregation, and I can tell you she doesn't eat nebia grass, she eats ugali. <laughs> in life, planning is a prudent thing to do. Do we plan? Do we sit down and plan before we execute the projects? David sit da sat down, planned everything. Let us learn to plan. Members of AIC Milimani and by extension Christians across the world who will follow this program on social media and other channels, 
Planning is important. Atutaki aibu, please let us learn to plan. As families, do we plan before undertaking major projects that we want to do? Do we sit down and plan? Or we say that there was some cash that I was expecting from somewhere. Now that they have arrived, let me just begin some project. Do we sit down and plan? And as we sit down and plan, do we have a conversation about it? Because this project is going to cut on other expenditures in life. Do we sit down and communicate even as we plan? That I am planning that this time I'll move from plot 10, now we'll be moving to our own property. And that means that I'll be taking a mortgage. And that means rippling effect of it is that for the whole of this year, we'll not be going out for dinners because we are doing cost cutting measures. And every member of the family understands as he listens. Do we plan? As employees, do we plan for our time of employment? Remember, we will not keep this job forever. Do we plan, even in our workstations? And even plan for our retirement? Retirement should not be a death sentence. Do we plan? David sat down and planned everything that he needed. And he reminds us to plan. Why plan? Because we are not permanent. We are not permanent. People pass on. And after they pass on, they leave chaos behind because there was no proper planning. This passage reminds us gently in a most gentle way that in life, planning is a prudent thing to do. If we are not planning, may the Lord help us to start planning from today onwards. Lesson number two that this passage brings to our attention is a lesson on parenting. And the lesson is, as parents, we need to educate our children about our plans. After planning, we need to educate our children about our planning. Chapter, six, uh, chapter 22, verse 6 to 10. David educates his son every step about what he was going to do. There is another by the name Mark Okot Obama Desenjo. Mark Okot Obama Desenjo said, parents are the bows, children are arrows. And then he said, parents give the energy and the direction, but they do not know how far the children can go. And he said the second thing, he said, children can either live their father's dreams or correct their father's mistakes. If we do not communicate our plans to our children, then we are leaving disaster behind. David, David after knowing that he was not going to do it, he takes Solomon aside and he educates him. Listen to what verse 7 says. Verse 7, in Amplified, David said to Solomon, My son, it was in my heart to build a house for the, uh, to the name and for the symbol of the presence of the Lord my God. It was in my heart. He communicates his plans to the children. Why is there a disconnect? Maybe because parents do not communicate their plans to the children. And verse 8 to 9, David gives the reasons why he was not going to do it. In fact, David accepts his own mortality. He knows that there is a time that he was going to be out. And so he explains to his son. Why do people have a lot of fears now because of the dread of the virus? Because the virus brings to our attention our own mortality it in a very strong way reminds us that Kumba, we can go. Kumba, we can go. Why was uh, our brother Murkong taking all the energy to explain to us these details so that we can continue our survival? But the, the virus is gently reminding us that Kumba, we can go. Kumba, this is a reality. Parents need to educate their children about their plans so that when we are not there, when they are gone, 
the children have a blueprint and knows that dad, this was his plan and this is what he wanted. When the CS announced about the virus, a young man in our family group WhatsApp said, now things are changing. And then he wrote the statement, it was nice meeting you all. <laughs> what was that statement up to? Worries. Let us educate our children on our plans. Talk to them. Talk your plans to your children. And I'm not telling you this, I'm talking to myself to tell my little son who is three years old and one who is getting to five now. He could be there almost. It is reminding me gently, as I remind you by extension, that we need to educate our children about our plans. David educates Solomon. And when David was gone, Solomon used the templates and he did everything that the father wanted. I can almost hear David talking to his son. Man to man talk, a very, very personal conversation. He's saying, son, isn't it a big shame for me as a king, living in a palace, in a magnificent palace, but the house of the Lord is just a tent out there. Boy, see, ni kubwa. And as he listens, Solomon listens to it, he internalizes it. And Solomon knows that any conversation about the temple is of interest to my dad. He can stop his business, he can stop his, I love tea. Anything that can cause me to stop my taking tea, you know, is of great interest to me, and that's wrestling. So, <laughs> as he's communicating to Solomon, Solomon is listening and internalizing. He knew that for Solomon to live out his plan, he must educate him. Edgar Dale Cohn uh, in education says, people remember 50% of what they see and hear. Our children need to see and need to hear what our direction and our plans in life are. Let us not keep it to ourselves. Sometimes as men, we keep things in our hearts. Especially our Kalenjin men say, you don't tell some things to the children. Maybe that is a disaster in waiting. Let us communicate these plans. Lesson number three and the final one on success that this passage brings to our attention. That to succeed in life, we need the prayers and support of others. Verse 11 to 19. To succeed in life, we need the prayers and support of others. People say the only thing you can do in life is to breathe in and out. That is the only thing you do alone. The rest you need support of others. And so Solomon, David, marshals up people around Solomon. He tells them, please, Solomon is still a young man. Please support him. Please support my son to succeed in this project. We need each other, my friends. We need our families. We need our friends. We need our neighbors. Even though some are very difficult to live with, but we need them. We need each other. We cannot succeed without them. The statement, I can do without you, when you are an oxygen supplier, is not for adults. That is for babies, babies on diapers. We need each other. David reminds Solomon that his secret of success is trusting in God in verse 11 to 16, but also from verse 17 to 19, he reminds him that he needs the support of others. My friends, brothers and sisters, members of this church, and by extension, Christians across the world, we cannot succeed alone. We need each other. As members of pastoral team, we cannot succeed alone. We need your prayers. We need your support. The local church council of this church cannot succeed alone. It needs our prayers, it needs our support. That is why the project team, the team in charge of the project, uh, stood here and said, we have to do it together. We need each other. Their success is our success. The ministries cannot succeed alone. We need our, they need our prayers and support. You cannot succeed alone. You need to be in a cell group. You need others. May the Lord bless us as we think about these three lessons and as we put them into practice. We need to plan 
in life. Let us plan. We need to communicate our plans to our children. Let us learn to communicate. We need the others' support for us to succeed. Let us grow up. Let us not say, I don't need you. We need each other. May the Lord bless us and be gracious to us as we think about these things.